welcome everyone uh, to uh, another edition of the Change Makers series here at Geetam University. And we're so happy to have with us Union Cabinet Minister Hardeep Singh Puri as our guest today. He holds the portfolios of Petroleum and Natural Gas and Housing and Urban Affairs. He has had a distinguished career in the Indian Foreign Service, which spanned nearly 40 years. He served as India's permanent representative to the United Nations, as well as key postings in other countries, including as ambassador to Brazil, deputy high commissioner to the UK, and other key postings. Mr. Puri uh, retired and then joined politics in 2014 in uh, what was seen as a rather interesting move. He's currently a Rajya Sabha MP. He's also contested a Lok Sabha election as well. And he has been uh, an acclaimed and published author uh, in addition to all his other string of achievements. So Mr. Hardeep Puri, great to talk to you uh, in this new avatar. Thank you so much for joining us here at Geetam University today. Let me begin first by asking you, you've just come back from Delhi airport in what was a rather emotional moment, we are seeing a crisis situation unfold in Afghanistan. And tell us uh, what that moment was like for you as you had to take back the three swaroops of the Guru Granth Sahib. Uh, thank you very much, Nidhi. Let me start by placing on record my uh, appreciation for your invitation to join this series. Uh, yes, I have just returned from the airport um, I felt deeply privileged that um, I was instructed or, uh, you know, requested to be at the airport, extend a welcome to our uh, brethren who, finding themselves in very difficult circumstances, on account of a situation which uh, is known to everyone. And three of our three of them who arrived by this flight, Air India flight, special flight, were carrying swaroops of the Holy Granth. And uh, uh, for any Sikh to be provided the privilege of paying obeisance, uh, I think uh, is a, an experience which I can in all humility describe as being one of a kind. So I feel, you know, in all humility, when situations of this kind evolve, uh, it's very proud to be an Indian because Mother India has always opened its arms to people uh, who are leaving situations which are war-torn or in turmoil. And the Prime Minister in the current situation has perhaps anticipated this all along. You know, India is uh, in fact a very good example of the principle of non refoulement uh, That is on which this entire uh, humanitarian uh, uh, philosophy is based. And over the centuries, people have uh, sought refuge in India. And, you know, when the CAA was enacted, Nidhiji, a lot of people opposed it for what I think, in retrospect, were very narrow political partisan reasons without understanding it. I mean, some of those who are uh, wanting to go to the airport and receive our brothers now were openly opposing it, including turban-wearing people from uh, the Punjab or Delhi. My point always has been that you look at the sentiment, a process. The cutoff date which was there was contextual to when the legislation was conceptualized and enacted, then they say, well, this hasn't been done. Look, all I can tell you is Mother India's open arms, the principle of non refoulement the Prime Minister's absolute clarity. And, you know, to make it partisan, but you are welcoming X and Y, not Z. Said who? We are welcoming everyone. But if you're talking about people who are likely to face adverse circumstance. I mean, I spoke to the three uh, 
uh, uh, brothers who came, uh, if I remember correctly, Himmat Singh, uh, 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 Kalraj Singh, and Dharminder Singh. I said, some of you decided to stay back. So he said, yes, five brothers decided to stay on to look after the Gurdwara side. And I asked him, I said, uh, and you know, very, very, very uh, candidly said in Punjabi, uh, uh, I suspect you understand Punjabi. Uh, so he said, Ki, de depend karta. you know, whether, whether, the, how the situation. So yes, to answer, give you a ra rather long-winded uh, explanation. I am moved. I moved. And I tell you, uh, the kind of life I, I've led, uh, you know, I've seen all kinds of situations in my professional career, but this was a deeply humbling experience. I'm going to come back to the points that you raised about, uh, you know, the CAA, et cetera, because uh, uh, the journalist in me can't uh, sort of resist asking you about that. But we'll come to that later, Mr. Puri, because what you described, as you said, was a deeply moving and also obviously a deeply personal moment as well uh, as, as, you, as you went to the airport this morning. But, you know, we want to get to know you and, and your, uh, your trajectory uh, a, a little better today. Um, Tell us a little bit about, you know, your life growing up. Your father was a civil servant as well, uh, and uh, you, you were born in Delhi. What was that like? He was a diplomat as well, if I'm not mistaken. What was your childhood like, moving around from one place to the next? Well, the first four years of my life, uh, I spent uh, with my parents in Delhi. Uh, I think it was in uh, 1956 or 57, that uh, my father moved on his first posting uh, to our embassy in Bonn, uh, in uh, the Federal Republic. Uh, I went to a German kindergarten. Uh, as a child, I had uh, long hair, you know, tied in the form of a guth at the back. And I had uh, some interesting experiences because, uh, uh, you know, Naughty German kids in a kindergarten, uh, how do they deal with you? I mean, they find it strange. So I was bullied around a bit, but the uh, I had a, uh, if you would like, the counsel of a German lady who in many ways was a second German mother to me. And she said the only way to deal with these young scruffians is to kick them just below the knee and kick them hard. I followed that and it taught me an important lesson in life that if somebody tries to bully you intellectually or physically, the best remedy is to stand up and give it right back. So to that extent, I think that defined my childhood, my years at Delhi University. Uh, I had schooling, yes, but my real formative years, which uh, perhaps explain what I am today is was those five years plus one spent in Delhi University. Three years as an undergraduate student of history at Hindu College, two years as a postgraduate student in the university and one year on the teaching staff of St. Stephen's College. Those six years, because I went to a school and you know, school you are sheltered. I went to an Anglo-Indian school and uh, because of my parents' My stay in Germany as a child, my parents were posted to Indochina after that. I stayed back in Delhi. Uh, so boarding school? Not really with grandparents. So a little stint in boarding school, but uh, difficult. Uh, because, uh, you know, the age is very impressionable. But, you know, at the age of 16, I entered Delhi University and I think then it took off. Then I discovered what uh, intellectual freedom is, what... Uh, how you are defined in terms of the choices you make, the friends you make. And after that, uh, I got into the Foreign Service uh, a very early first attempt. I was a very young uh, uh, entrant. I joined, um, I took the exam at the first opportunity, got in. And Lakshmi and I both then after that had long um, uh, and continuing stint of postings. And you were very kind, you introduced me in terms of uh, where I ended up as an ambassador, uh, you know, equivalent rank, which I held for 14 years. But, you know, some of the younger, earlier postings were very interesting, trying to uh, wage peace in Sri Lanka. Yes. I was um, assigned to be the interlocutor 
uh, from the you know uh, government's political side i'm sure our intelligence agencies had contacts with uh, some of the uh, militant groups but i was assigned to go and meet uh, the ltt supremo velu pillai prabhakaran uh, in the uh, badamarachi area in the you know in the hideout and that's a defining experience uh, so when i i can tell you in a lighter way i know i met you in new york and i think i was traveling to washington and you were also on that train that's right and uh, when i when india got elected to the security council uh, and india was given the privilege of chairing the security uh, of the uh, counter terrorism committee the 1373 committee if i remember i was one of the few uh, chairs of that committee could say that i have actually dealt with terror up front up front means if you negotiate uh, with uh, somebody like an ltt chief and you deal with others so i must say those who are defining uh, moments uh, uh, the uh, rough and tumble of uh, political life uh, you know thereafter if i may be permitted to say so i i'm very cautious about uh, conscious about the terms one uses here that becomes slightly lightweight uh, <laughs> i can imagine <laughs> yeah so you know because here you are looking at uh, uh, somebody once asked me um, how do you compare the militancy you have in india with the militancy you have in sri lanka and i said certain things which i don't think i should repeat here but i said it's a completely different genre uh, you know that was the era of the cyanide pill yeah uh, that was the era where if a negotiation failed as i remember when palali air base was uh, under capture and uh, uh, the ltt decided that rather than risk capture by the uh, what they call the sinhala army or the sri lankan armed forces that rather uh, i don't remember the exact number maybe 17 of them decided to take the uh, cyanide pill and uh, end their lives so it's a it's a charged atmosphere when you are operating there uh over the years can i one has had to sorry sorry no sorry i because i i i before we get to the political part of it i really am interested in sort of uh, looking more at your, your your foreign service career and before that at a more personal level uh when do you think you ran into your first failure in life this is a very important question because we learn we all fail at some point we don't always succeed and it's how we handle that failure that makes us who we are in my opinion uh when did you first encounter your first big disappointment or failure and how did you deal with that what, what was first of, all, first of all i think failure is a very strong term disappoint that's why i said disappoint disappointment disappointment is a correct term i think my there are three there are three or four parts to every individual in my case the uh, academic life or work is one professional which they are too closely related i was very disappointed uh, with my school result i mean i shouldn't talk like this but i was always expected to do maybe wrong perception exceptionally well i didn't do so well but i got into a very good college hindu college delhi university and there was a like continuing you know it used to rankle that maybe that's a correct term that my god you have to prove a point and i did i ended up topping the university in the b honors history exam so that that was one disappointment which i think i was able to overcome my mother used to say to me not so much to others you know if this guy works hard he could do very well so there was always this thing about hard work and i tell lakshmi is now i said i wish my mother was alive at least only to see that i am capable of working hard that's all nothing more than that you prove it to yourself to your parents that you know you are professionally i can tell you uh, whether you are a professional civil servant or you are a politician you try to organize yourself you know you talk about a change maker series 
Now, most of us don't even realize that we are part of the change, that we are unconsciously producing that change. Most of us don't realize because there is a constant struggle between continuity and change. Change which is revolutionary comes through the French Revolution, you know, the present revolution in China, or let's say uh, the Bolshevik. But that's not what we deal with in daily life. The daily life, you deal with a situation which is not of your making. You put in place a number of considerations to propel you forward. My God, you deal with disappointments on a daily basis. You do things out of goodwill, out of wanting to do well, and it suddenly turns around and acquires a new shape. Why? Because somebody, and I tell you, disappointments, I, I, I don't want to be critical, but today, by virtue of globalization, the instant spread of news, and now social media, you don't know when you're caught up with something, where somebody twists your words completely out of turn. And I think policy making, and I've been extremely fortunate, extremely fortunate that I have throughout my foreign service career and after uh, the Honorable Prime Minister inducted me, been in situations where I think I can contribute. But there are disappointments every day. People don't understand what they're doing and they will come at you, you know. But let me talk about policy. I was sitting through a meeting in New York when the then Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, was meeting his Sri Lankan counterpart. And he had been briefed by everybody and he had been briefed on what the Sri Lankans are going to say, what he should say. And, you know, out of sheer politeness, he turned around and asked me, he said in a very, you know, very philosophical way, would the ambassador like to say it? So I said, sir, please appeal to him and tell him that what he needs to do, he needs to do for his own citizens. I mean, the Tamils are his citizens. I said, just, I just did point. The point is, look at the amount of work we invested. And sometimes you get the feeling that things will go completely round. I mean, we talked about Afghanistan today. I mean, I'm a student of history, Nidhi, and so are you. I mean, if you look at the history of Afghanistan, uh, and again, I'm not being political at all. Don't look at the 20 years of the American presence or the trillion dollars went down, a uh, trillion plus, I don't know. Or the Soviet era and what went down there. Or I trace it back to the arrival of the Turks, you know, the Delhi Sultanate, Iltutmish, Alauddin Khilji, and so on. So, I mean, so, you know, I, since I'm a student of history, and when I see some, some farcical situations around me develop, I uh, in a in a in a batch in a colleague's uh, book review the other day book book launch, and I was asked about a situation. I said, you know, I'm tempted to quote uh, the man who uh, sat in the London Museum and wrote the Communist Manifesto, the Bard himself, Karl Marx, and he wrote, I think, the 18th Brumaire to Louis Napole uh, Bonaparte. He wrote, um, Hegel wrote somewhere that history repeats itself. And then Marx says, he should have added, Hegel should have added, first time as tragedy, second time as farce. Now, you take that and apply it to your and my daily existence. Uh, do we learn from history? No, but as a professional, you put your best into it. Yeah. And then you put your best into it, you have your disappointments, but as long as you think you're on the right trajectory, I think that is what, I think fulfillment is too strong a term, just as I think failure is too strong a term, because we are all individual actors. Many of us, I mean, change maker, somebody said a good individual, a good leader is one who can give it a decisive turn. Some leaders do it, some are not able to do it. Well, that's a good lesson. Keep going. Don't stop, especially if you're convinced, uh, you have the courage of your conviction, uh, keep at it and keep going. Let's talk about your switch to uh, to politics. Then, what was that like for you? I mean, what what a what prompted you to make that jump into politics, and um, why? I didn't make the jump. I was always a part of a process. I was into student activism. 
student uh, leadership is too strong a term i was a office bearer elected office bearer when i was in delhi university i was uh, prime minister of the hindu college parliament which is like the yeah president of a student union now a lot of people that I, that i were i were i was associated with uh, came into political life i just give you a few examples uh, many of the people who were in the leadership of the bjp from 2014 are people i had the privilege of an association with since uh, you know 1971 72 i mean and I, i i i think i have the privilege of calling them friends i mean many of the people i taught at university who are not i didn't teach again that's a too strong a term i was in the teaching faculty and there were students in st stephen's college who were in political life mr tharoor mr chandan mitra dr shopan das gupta just to give you a, a my friend thak and they go into different uh, ideological or political um, uh, processes through a prism so i was already always a part of that process i spent 39 years in the foreign service and then 3 years after that uh, as secretary general of an independent commission uh, which kevin rudd chaired and i was a secretary general so a total of 42 years but you know there is a perception somewhere that politics diplomacy is all about the old world but you know i think kevin rudd got it absolutely right the minute i was inducted into the council of ministers he sent me a message to rather he made a comment somewhere he says what a natural uh, progression so somebody asked him why he said as ambassador and permanent representative to the un he was dealing with millennium development goals and now the sustainable development goals which i was also dealing with when i was secretary general of the commission and now he has been appointed minister to see the implementation of five of those goals of the 17 goals 11 inclusive cities so but i want to give you another answer answer is modi ji's ministers because of the hands on forward looking programmatic policies that he has both in terms of urban rejuvenation or green energy etc his ministers tend to be ministers more in the mold of being technocrats not all of them many of them because you are you are participating in a team so my short answer is it wasn't as difficult a transition yeah there is i mean i tell you a story i hope i don't get uh, misquoted <laughs> when arun ji was alive he told another senior minister who may whose name i probably shouldn't take he said ki problem with hardeep is that you know he reacts like a civil servant so somebody this a senior minister turned around and said thank god at least one of us does you see there is nothing wrong in being a civil servant where you say well sorry these are the choices you've got because the kind of decision making you do also plays on both i i am a strong believer that a good political figure needs very good advisors and good uh, civil servants to give him the option equally civil servants need very strong hands on political leadership so that you know they are otherwise are going to have you have n number of choices i mean when i was a student in the university and we used to denigrate somebody it's a brilliant mind he will give you 20 things to do but he will not tell you what to do so it's an interplay it's an interplay and i think the kind of transformation economic social political that a country is getting through uh it's a learning experience for me certainly but one that i professionally find again as i said i wouldn't use the word rewarding against a wrong term but you can sit back and say you've been able to you have the satisfaction that you've cr- contributed your little bit to it that's interesting uh, how you describe uh, the 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 transition and how it it was such a natural progression um uh, i'm going to take some questions from our students for you mr puri because there's a whole host of them you you handle so many portfolios important ones uh, harsha kavi is one of our students at the kotilia school of public policy who's dean by the way said akbaruddin was also a uh, pr to the united nations uh, but uh, harsha's question is about you know planning of our cities 
you know, she's saying that every other major city in the world, when you look at when you look at how they've been planned, it's there's a certain level of perfection. She's taken the example of Madrid. So, um, what steps are we taking to plan our cities better? Uh, uh, is is her question to you? I think it's a very valid question, but um, and I I'd be happy to answer it, and I can give you a 45 minute answer or a two minute answer. Look, in 1947, 17 percent of India lived in urban spaces, which is the cities. That means 17 percent of 350 million. The latest census that we have, which is a 2011 census, and we're going to get another one now. But let me fast forward from the current to what are we going to be like in terms of an urban population in 2030? And Nidhiji, we will have 600 million people living in Indian cities by 2030. Wow. These are our people. Democracy means that Nidhi Rajdhan can move from Delhi to Hyderabad, to Bengaluru, to Chandigarh, wherever she likes to go. So there is what I call an autonomous and robust process of urbanization which is going on. Now, what do you need to make cities inclusive, like goal 11 of the SDGs? Well, I'll give you a short statistic. 10 years, of UPA government led by the Congress party between 2004 and 2014, the total amount of money spent and money spent is always a reasonably good indicator because I can tell you then what happened. 1,57,000 crores in 10 years. In the seven years of the... In the seven years of the Modi government, but you don't take seven because it is actually six, the program started in June 2015. We have spent six or six and a half times the amount, I think 11 lakh plus crores. It's a huge now, It's six times, six times in half the period. That's 10 years, this is six years, slightly over 60% of the time. Now, very interesting, housing. Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana, the Honorable Prime Minister said that it's his dream that by the time India reaches 2022, every Indian should have a home above his or her head. Pakka home with a toilet, with a kitchen, ujwala, gas, etc. So we did a demand assessment much before I became a minister. And the demand assessment was you need to build one crore homes. But interesting, the prime minister said that the title of the home will have to be in the name of the lady of the house. So gender, women's empowerment. And we had to build, as per the revised assessment, one crore 12 lakh. Lady, I'm very happy to inform you, we've already sanctioned one crore 13 lakhs, out of which 55 lakh Beneficiaries have already moved into those. Over 82 lakh beneficiaries will have their homes completed in the next five to six months. Give you a Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana. Amrut, 500 of our cities with a population of over 100,000 or 1 lakh. Water tap, water, stormwater drainage, septage, sewage. Urban transport. In 2002, when Vajpayee Ji was Prime Minister, we started metro rail system. The first line, I think 30 or 40 kilometers was laid in 2002. Nidhi Ji, in the national capital region of Delhi itself, we today have 370 plus kilometers of metro running. The average ridership pre-COVID was 65 lakhs a day. Good urban transport policy means you move people around. You don't move cars around or personal transport around. I go out to smart cities. I go on to so. So we're getting there. We're 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 doing. We're taking incremental steps, and we're getting there. And actually, as you as you're pointing out, much more money has been spent towards reaching those goals. Six times more money. 
in, in, in the last seven years. I think, Harsha, that may answer your question. You won't see something happen instantly overnight. I would like, I would like to tell Harsha that it's probably not a complete answer because I would then go through each of the programmatic okay. districts. But if any of you ever, ever have an interest, come to my Nirman Bhavan office. We have what is called an urban observatory where with the use of technology, any housing project anywhere. Now, we are not just building homes. Uh, the Prime Minister declared a full year as a global housing technology challenge. And we have six lighthouse projects taking place where in less than one year using the world's most advanced technologies, whether American, Spanish, etc., six different technologies out of 54 listed. Lighthouse projects are coming up, but 1,000 apartments are being built in one year's time. I'd love to show you that. I'd love to show you how through satellite imagery and drones, we can tell you exactly how much work is done. When the Prime Minister reviewed these lighthouse projects, I think what, six weeks ago, eight, six weeks ago, he was shown work as it was going on through drones. So we've come a long way. Uh, I believe, I believe that this is, and this is the center of it, whether it's a smart city thing, it's not what the government wants to do. All these projects, including a smart city and other projects, they are based essentially, Harsha, on citizenship and stakeholder consultation. The citizens have to say what projects they want to see included. And once the citizens say that, we make a determination, then we go ahead and public-private. You know, you can't have a system where the government, for instance, in smart cities, out of a total of 205,000 crore, I think about 45,000 is public-private partnership. So business, private, NGO, civil society, and so on. There's an interesting question. Uh, this is now related to your other ministry. Rawson Gonzalez is asking about India's energy requirements, saying that China has entered to a strategic agreement with Saudi Arabia for their energy requirements for the next 50 years. And the Saudis have said they will prioritize China's energy supply. Do we have any similar agreement in the pipeline to secure India's potential future energy demands? That's a question that I would like to answer in terms of first, what is India's energy requirement? India and China are the two world's largest um, countries. Uh, we have a slightly different situation in China as we have here. China is a $12 trillion economy. We were $3 trillion economy pre-COVID. Uh, pre we'll be $5 trillion in a few years' time and $10 trillion hopefully by 2030, by which time China would also have moved ahead. Our per capita energy consumption is low by global standards. But there are some fascinating things happening. 85% of our requirements have to be imported. Now, we need to do two things. We need to enter both into long-term ar arrangements with countries. And we also need to enhance the base for our exploration. Now, if memory serves me right, our total land area is what, 3.5 million square kilometers, out of which only about 8% is currently under exploration. So we need to do much more on that. By the way, the long-term agreement that Saudi Arabia and China are talking about, I don't think that's in fossil fuels. That I think is a, a green energy uh, uh, arrangement because nobody would want to continue importing fossil fuels for 50 years. Why am I saying this? When I was ambassador to Brazil, we were trying to have a biofuels mix in our petrol. You know, Brazil is a country where at the bunk you can decide, depending on the price on that day, whether you want 100% petrol or 100% ethanol depending on that. And you can have a mix 50, 50, 70, 30, whichever way you like. Now, we wanted 5%, and I'm talking about the year of the Lord, 2006, 7. We couldn't get the ethanol to do 5% in 15 states and union territories. Today, we've already reached 8.5%, and the Prime Minister said that we should do 10% by 2024, 20, 25, and we'll get there. Gas from 6% in our energy mix is going up to 15%. So there are revolutionary things happening. Uh, 
we are today looking at energy both in terms of access affordability but most of all also sustainability i mean people i think there there will come a time i mean you're young so you probably be still around where people say petrol car what was that i mean yesterday i was in a meeting with international think think tank although that's under chatham house rules but i don't have no uh, well some people say the nordics are saying that um, electric uh, vehicles are around the corner european union i think has a a plan by what 2035 and uh, some people say even 20 years to, i don't know india is bhed chal i mean once you start off you will reach a stage where people may shift very quickly now uh, i've been uh, correctly uh, advised you see when you talk about long term he said you should say that we have existing long term agreements on supply of all oil, oil as well as gas from major suppliers qatar uae saudi arabia and other part i mean i took that for granted but yeah. when you're talking about 50 years when you're talking about 50 years you're talking about a paradigmatic shift from traditional to new green that's it well there's some i i i just want to draw your attention to what the honorable prime minister said from the ramparts of the red fort as recently as 15th august 2021 he said we are spending 12 lakh crores a year on imports of energy that has to stop by the time we are 100 years old as a independent nation number one second thing he said was green hydrogen mission and i think green hydrogen is what everybody is talking about today so i think these are changes taking place the answer to this question um, uh, i'm sorry who was the person who asked it girish Ro no. rowen Ro rosen gonzalez yes to mr gonzalez yes absolutely we are on the same track all right so mr puri let me come back to uh, let me come back to the the issue of afghanistan for a moment and you know what you had said right at the beginning about you know the caa now just to be the devil's advocate here many of those who had spoken out against the caa in the form in which it was passed didn't object to india giving shelter to minorities from other countries i think the primary issue was that why should we single out certain religions why should not we give shelter to all uh, because that is for instance what we are doing afghan refugees who are coming to india today they're not being discriminated on the basis of their religion there are afghans afghan muslims there are sikhs there are hindus everyone's coming the caa itself has a cut off date of 2014 december 2014 i think what some people are are, are raising is that more than the caa do you think india needs a proper refugee policy to address these issues rather than focus on just uh, you know a single law like the caa so i think you just answered your own question india has never turned its back that's what i meant by non refoulement you don't yeah. turn turn away anyone they've been coming all the time but look i think these guys who objected to it i'm sorry to have to say this these are philosophers philosophizing with a false conscience that's why they're being caught out now i was being slightly mischievous when i tweeted 2 3 days ago i mean you didn't want a ca with a cut off of 2014 you didn't say no i don't want 2014 i want 2020 you didn't say that they turned it into partisan political slugfest that is what my point was look india mother india is greater than all of us put together somebody has to take that and stand up and say but listen the guys who were being persecuted there are not ex religion if ex religion is persecuted he can come in in any case when we take them in we are taking them in now but it is two minorities people who are minor you are talking about persecuted minority if somebody in a of a majority religion nidhi i don't have to tell you this there are so many famous names of people who came in from ex country and i'm see i'm choosing my words to steer clear from my mea uh, uh, days etc i'm talking about humanitarian refugee sentiment and india has always been like that but what they do is when it comes to a bjp led government which has 303 in parliament which has suddenly transformed the political narrative they pick out the wrong things now 
who is not in favor of good relations with neighbors but you take that out of context and you overlook an evolving security situation which is likely to impact some minorities by virtue of their small numbers more seriously than others that's all i'm saying and i think we're all on the same wavelength except that you know if our i, I said in parliament also agar rajnaitik rotiyan sekni hai to be my guest i i talk to you about it the same thing came on on vaccine same thing came on um, uh, you know all the other major issues but they're fighting a losing battle absolutely losing battle i mean you disrupt parliament and you don't want to have a discussion you'd like to think i mean what happened the prime minister tried to introduce 40 new members of parliament and i just did a jan ashirwad yatra in delhi my god the response electrified people because people came out not to bless the newly appointed but he came out to say your policies unauthorized colonies ujwala free gas cylinder those are things now my you point about, is you talked about parliament sorry sorry to interrupt there and you know that's a very good point because we at at the cotillia school of public policy which is a part of geetham just last week we had our orientation and that was one of the things we talked about how do we save an institution like parliament which is so integral to our democracy now uh mr puri let me ask you i mean you've been you've been a diplomat um you know the art of negotiation do you think that what we need desperately right now is a better dialogue between the opposition and the government because at the moment it does feel a bit like political opponents have also become enemies of each other and it it never used to be that way so how how do we create that space to have a dialogue even with differences so that we can have those debates in parliament and pass bills with discussion rather than pass them within 10 minutes without discussion okay why one minute one minute let me just tell you uh discussion negotiation is defined in terms of the um, it takes two to tango approach you know the enemy in the case of uh, covid i kept telling them in parliament listen to my 12 minute clip the enemy is the virus not the government of course uh, so where is the vaccine where you have a situation today where by the end of august we would have done what 60 crore vaccination i asked mansukh bhai mandavia i said uh, how much vaccine brother in uh, september is at 20 crores how many in october 30 crore are bhai 60 crore kar liya another 50 crore coming and what was this halla about i tell you i am i am privy to something that happened in the congress party they said let us not allow any discussion to take place let's only have a discussion on the covid and you know what happened they lost that discussion there was a four hour discussion and the congress and the opposition lost it squarely because we were so good on our facts my concern is not parliament is a very strong institution you know if if i have videos of me trying to disrupt parliament played back to my constituents and next time nidhi i go and ask for a vote they say what the so and so were you doing there you represent the aspirations of your electorate people who vote for you which is sacred you come into the temple of democracy what are the scenes we have of there here i mean i i tell you i tell you an interesting light uh, my colleague is speaking mr vaishnav you come lift the paper from his hand tear it and throw it that's not the issue i told my friend i don't know where i should name him i said i'm going to recommend that in the olympics there be another category of 50 plus age group somebody wearing a turban who can throw a briefcase like a javelin into the face of the presiding officer by standing on the table of the house now tell me you want dialogue on this i i am very clear you want a dialogue dialogue through you you know when you invited me somebody turned around and said are you sure you want to talk to nidhi i said why not so but why you know I No, no. Right. You know, you were doing that format. And when I asked my colleague, I said, "What is the format?" He said, "45 minutes and question and answer." I said, "I agree." NDTV, NDTV baggage. No, 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 no. NDTV. I I used to appear in NDTV. Come on, on NDTV also exactly. I used to interact on. I'm saying something different. Huh. I'm saying that Parliament will be around. We are facing a very different situation. One of my books I've written. I think I gave it to you. 
that between the 2014 election and the 2019 election, Congress party in both put together don't doesn't have 100 seats in the Lok Sabha. In between Kerala and West Bengal, partnering with different parties, they drew a zero. With the current evolving situation in Uttar Pradesh, which is what the fulcrum where the Congress party started, Look, it's that problem. Now, I have no difficulty in all of them trying to coalesce and find a coalition amongst themselves. That's what politics is all about. But we repeatedly invite them to talk. Okay, I'm not the leader of the house, but I know my friend Piyush Ji is. I know what between Piyush Ji, Mukhtar Abbas, Nakvi, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, Minister for Parliamentary Affairs, always reaching out. But they took a decision not to allow parliament to function except something. Now, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to succumb to that and not have our legislation passed when we have the numbers? But, I mean, but like, passing legislation isn't just about numbers. It's also no, about no, no, passing no, committees. I don't agree with government business and ordinance should remain an ordinance. We should re-promulgate the ordinance. I am sorry. A government which has a legitimate right through numbers and it is inviting the other side to participate. They participated, I told you in two debates, they participated. OBC, they participated. Why? Because they did not want to go back and say they oppose the OBC. So this is what I call selective decision on what to participate in. As far as I, 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 I'm not a government uh, uh, floor manager, but I would say you want to play this selective participation game. Come and be my guest. Well, actually, one opposition leader did say that last week as well, that, uh, you know, by taking part in one debate or two debates and not taking part in others, that hurts the opposition's cause. But I guess my question was, is there a way, uh, you know, for both sides to be able to reach out and speak to one another? Uh, we can only hope because as citizens, ultimately, we lose out if we don't see legislation passed with a proper discussion or for legislation to go to committees. I know you're out of time, Mr. Puri. And you have to go. Tell you, I can tell you, we are ready for that. You can take away this message both to your students and anyone else who is listening. Government stands ready to talk both on the urgent, important issues of the day and on how to take this forward. We've invited them a number of times. My own feeling is once they realize, like, and the Janeshirwa Yatra, I put this. I mean, as I said, if the Prime Minister had introduced it, maybe out of the 40 new ministers, people would remember the name of five. Now, each one of them has been through their constituencies. Every constituent will remember Inka Naam Kya. So these things, politics and democracy has a dynamic of its own. I want to, before we go, Mr. Puri, ask you about, um, you know, your wife, your partner, Lakshmi Puri, who is a distinguished diplomat and has her, had her own distinguished career in diplomacy. Uh, what has that been like, that partnership? It's, it's very unique. Uh, and uh, I'm sure it's been a great source of strength for both of you in your journeys. Well, I don't know about both of us, but she is more than just a partner. I mean, she's also my soulmate. And uh, I mean, look, we we met in the academy. We got married in, uh, uh, you know, beginning of 1975. Uh, but, you know, it's also, a, it's, a, it's a very uh, interesting type of companionship. And I deeply respect that the fact that, you know, she was an assistant secretary general in the UN. She had just signed an extension of her contract in UN Women. She had just signed it. She heard, because I was in Colombo when I was, uh, uh, when I came back and I was invited to see my boss, uh, the Honorable Prime Minister, and she thought I had not called after I come back after a flight, we call each other. So she asked my driver, Kahan. So when the driver told her, what the boss ko milne gaya hai? So he said, boss ko kis liye milne gaya hai? You know, this is a normal, normal question that you ask. When I came back, I said, I'll let you know. So I said, I'll get back to you. I spoke to her in Japanese. I said, um, which means she understood. I didn't want to say something sitting in a car. And then she said, my sister just called me from Mumbai and said, your name is, a, you know, she told me, why didn't you tell me? So I said, I didn't know. I was just invited and to, to join the council of ministers. And tomorrow is the swearing in. And by that time, the, the, the Sukhiya or the ticker, ticker was carrying it. You know what she told me? I have to go back and tell the Secretary General, I've just signed an extension. I said, you go and tell him. And I didn't tell her. She left it all and came back. And I'm telling you, 
apart from apart from companionship etc you know it's a it's a relationship where i greatly value not a counsel but i think she also ensures that i um, i make less number of mistakes that i would otherwise be prone to uh, making all of us make mistakes yeah i think you've revealed something very interesting that you talk to each other in in other languages like japanese that's fascinating when you when you don't want to when you don't want to say much more in the car but mr puri i have to though ask you one 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 more question before we go uh you know and and this is not as a representative of of the government as such but having been in diplomacy for so many years and seeing the situation in afghanistan would you say that a very difficult uh, uh choice lies ahead for india in terms of whether or not it should engage or recognize even the taliban government in afghanistan it's it's not it's it's tricky isn't it uh come again i'm sorry i i lost you for a second what is the it, do you think that it's a very tricky uh and difficult choice for india as far as afghanistan's future is concerned whether or not to recognize this government there led by the taliban uh and and i know you can't answer this perhaps very frankly because you are a minister but uh is is it a difficult road ahead no i all i can tell you this is a question which would be most appropriately put to my colleague mr jay shankar uh i don't think uh, it would be uh appropriate for me to answer it it is a difficult situation on that that is uh, something that is looking at that you will have to tread carefully both in terms of that but you know uh once things begin to uh uh become clearer clearer that's now there are preoccupations people want uh you know their citizens their uh, others uh, uh to be evacuated but i'm sure this is in very safe hands the prime minister and the senior members of the government are applying their minds both to the evolving situation and i'm absolutely sure that not only since the time uh, these developments took place and as uh, uh, events are unfolding uh, it is this policy and our reactions and how we go forward will be uh, very professionally and competently managed mr hardeep puri thank you so much for giving us your time uh, today it was a pleasure to talk to you get some insights uh, into your life beyond what we see uh, on our screens uh, as minister uh, i learned a few new things uh, whether it's about uh, you know the the languages you speak or the way you stand up to bullies so that that was uh, something new i also learned today great to talk to you again mr puri thank you nidhi ji thank you Bye.